I have a story to tell. I was reading about uh, another programming language called Coca. And uh, this is a really cool just kind of uh, research project. Uh, it's a it's a functional programming language. So I'm a I'm a huge language guy. I'm doing a master's at the U right now, doing language stuff, and uh, so and I love functional programming as well. Uh, I know this isn't necessarily a functional programming group, but some people might know what I'm talking about. Um, and in in functional programming, a lot of times you make pure functions, which are functions that just take some input and produce some output and don't produce any side effects. They don't mutate anything. If you give them the same thing, they'll always produce the same thing. That's And that's just kind of the style of programming you want to do a lot in functional programming. You get a lot of benefits from it, and you can you can find out more about that. Um, but in this language here, uh, they've been doing a lot of cool stuff with the compiler. And uh, one of the things the compiler does is, well, OK, so backing up, in functional programming, a lot of times you, you, you're not mutating anything. So often you'll take a data structure and then copy it in order to produce a modified version of it rather than mutate it in place. That's a really common thing to do in functional programming. As you can imagine, it's not super efficient and it uses a lot more memory. Um, you kind of need a lot more garbage collection with that. So what this language is doing is it's statically analyzing uh, to see if um, a data structure you've used is not going to be used again after you've done some operation on it. And so it says, well, instead of creating a new one, I'm just going to mutate it in place and pretend that we're doing everything purely functional. Uh, and so it, it'll it analyze that and then put that in if it thinks that it can do that. And so I thought, well, we can kind of do that manually with Rust just using ownership. Um, so I thought of uh, creating a stack data type that um, instead of uh, Instead of doing something like giving it a reference that it mutates to do its operations, it for the user of the stack, it's as if you're doing pre functional programming. But under the hood, it's actually mutating it. So let me just kind of like show what I'm talking about here. So I've created this stack here. And I'll, I'll show you what this product is later, if you're interested. Um, is you, uh, so you have your push, your peak, your pop. Uh, the thing I want to direct your attention to is push and pop here. So for push, we take in mutable self. And then we, under the hood, we're just using a vec. Um, and we push that vec, and then we just return ourselves. Um, same idea with pop. We take mute self. We pop the thing off the stack. And then we return a tuple of the value and the new stack after the pop has been complete. So to the caller of this API, oh, hang on, let's see here. Where's the caller? So the caller, it's as if you're doing something purely functional. I have a stack, and I want a new stack that is this stack as if you pop, push something onto it or pop something off of it. So down here, um, I'm just uh, executing. Why don't, why don't we look at what this project is, actually? This is probably a good time. So if I do you, um, run. So this is a, a little uh, stack-based programming language I made. Uh, probably a lot to explain. But if you've ever done anything like APL, uh, think of it as APL meets fourth. Uh, fourth is a stack-based language where uh, you put words together, and then it executes each one, and each one will do something to a stack that's running along. So this language has a stack, but each value is a is a matrix, and so the um, operations we're doing on it are matrix operations. So just kind of like show it off, uh, it, and you know, I say one, I put one onto the stack. I say one, two, I put one and then a two onto the stack. Um, and then I can take that and add them together. And these are actually just matrices. So um, I can put them together into their own matrix. I can create another matrix on that stack. And then I can add them together like that. And there's a couple other things we can do. And we can, we can play with it more if you're interested. So for this language, we have values and we have words. Words act on the stack. So 
this is what this execute thing is doing here. It's taking um, an expression, which can be a number or a word, and then it's taking a stack and it's performing that action on the stack. And instead of performing it and you know doing it kind of imperatively, it's actually doing it in a purely functional way from our perspective here at execute, which is just uh, doing the push and then returning whatever that value comes out to be. Um, so then down here, uh, we can execute a whole line by creating one stack, getting, you know, tokenizing our, our whole expressions, our whole program basically, which is just a line right now, uh, creating expressions out of it by parsing them. And then we just say that our new stack is the old stack after it's been folded over with all these expressions. And isn't that just so elegant, right? No, no references, no mutation, just folding along. But the cool thing is, is that with the ownership semantics, it automatically makes it so that any previous reference to the stack is invalidated as soon as we transfer ownership. So there's always only one stack in memory the whole time. There's just one identifier that can look at it. So I don't know what the consequences of this are. I just thought it was a cool thing. Uh, so yeah. Any questions? So why are you taking new self instead of taking self by value? That's a good question. So it's because I, I am actually mutating under the hood. Um, I, it, yeah, so if I got rid of this, for example, uh, then I would expect this to break saying that, um, yeah, we can't borrow as mutable to change the underlying vector. But couldn't you take ownership of yourself? Wouldn't that be more consistent with what you're trying to do? It's yeah, it is taking ownership of self, actually. Um, it's, this is actually something I learned trying to do this, was just putting mute there. You're taking ownership of it, or you're taking ownership of it oh, mutably. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you took it as a reference, then you'd be borrowing. Yeah. Yes, yes. And it, your ownership would stay back, but we're, we're passing ownership. Yeah, you. exactly. It's kind of like backwards to how you normally think when you're writing Rust. Like, because usually you're thinking, well, I want to keep it up here where it's being used. I'm just going to let it borrow down here. And then, you know, when we come up, we still have it. In this case, it's like, no, take it. <laughs> take it. And oh. I don't want to ever use this again. Give me back something, and then I'm going to use that, <laughs> you know? Right, right. No, but actually, I think for us, we intended to be used that way. I mean, I think that's, I mean, you can use it either way. It makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting, huh? Because it, it is nice. You can kind of, uh, from the API perspective, like the user of the, of the uh, you know, API here, it's like you're using pure functions, but we're cheating, actually. There's all, we're not doing any copying, and we are using the semantics of the language to invalidate the old versions so that, oh, yeah. so that you're never referring to something that's invalid or <laughs> old, old news. So... Yeah, I'm not sure exactly when you want to use this. It was kind of fun to use it in this experiment. Uh, but yeah, I just thought it was interesting. Cool. Yeah. Thank you.